I'm James Foster, the co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP as we call it, here in the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. I'm also the moderator of today's presentation by Rohini Pandey of Yale University on the topic, Theory and Practice, the Economics of Implementation and India's COVID-19 Response. Rohini, thank you for joining us live from Boston, I understand, here in the heart of DC. Also with us today are Ravi Kanbar of Cornell University and Jayati Ghosh, who recently joined the University of Massachusetts Amherst after many years at JNU in Delhi. It so happens that I owe debts of gratitude to both of today's discussants. Professor Kanbar is responsible for propelling my early work on poverty measurement, which, which morphed into the Alkire Foster measure, which is now being used by Niti Ayog for India's multidimensional poverty index. Thank you, Ravi, for your continued report, uh, support during these years. And Professor Ghosh, you and JNU gave me two of my finest doctoral students, Shuman Seth and Shivana Mitra, who have made substantial contributions to this area. Thank you. Now, in just a moment, I'll invite IAEP distinguished visiting scholar Ajay Chibur, who has organized the series, to set the stage and formally introduce our distinguished guests. But first, a word of thanks to our co-sponsor, the Seeger Center for Asian Studies, located right next door in the Elliott School with its goals of supporting research on Asia, promoting interaction, and educating the next generation. And director Ben Hopkins, who is himself a prominent historian of modern South Asia. Now, for those of you who haven't attended a previous IEP event, you can expect a nonpartisan, lively, and informative conversation on such topics as US-China economic relations, urbanization and poverty, global economic governance, climate change, green finance, and digital trade. Our Facing Inequality webinar series is a multidisciplinary conversation on what perhaps is the main socioeconomic challenge of our age, with contributions from Branko Milanovic, Nora Lustig, and many others since it commenced last summer. <clears throat> our 13th annual US-China conference recently began with a keynote address by World Bank Chief Economist Carmen Reinhardt, and our next installment is planned for November 20th, when Michael Song and John Rogers will discuss pandemics and China. Today's episode of Envisioning India is the third in the series, which began this fall with Viral Acharya on finance in India and continued with Raghu Rajan and Bina Agarwal on COVID-19. Please join us in December when Pranab Bardhan of Berkeley comes to GWU for the next episode of Envisioning India on capitalism in India with discussion uh, by Michael Walton. If you can't make an event synchronously, videos can be found on our YouTube channel at IIEP GW. So thank you very much. And now over to my colleague, Ajay Shivar. Professor? Before I go to them, uh, let me just say that last month when we had Raghuram Rajan and Bina Agarwal speaking, India was peaking. Uh, COVID rates in India were going astronomically high. Uh, and I and we were thinking that India would surely out, uh, you know, outrun the US on COVID. But since then, there's been a bit of a reversal. The India's rates have peaked, come down. They're like running at around 40, 45,000 a day. Whereas the US, as we all know, has now jumped to close to 140,000 a day. So I don't think we're in this race anymore, hopefully. Although with winter coming in India too, we are seeing rates rise in Delhi. So, you know, these things come in these sort of waves. They look more like Pondratier cycles, uh, quite frankly. And I mean, I hope we don't get into that kind of a, a third, second or third wave. But uh, anyway, we'll, we'll have a very interesting discussion today. But uh, as Jayati, Jayati and I wrote a uh, UN report after the last global financial crisis, uh, where we looked at 20, 30 countries in Asia, she might remember that. And of course, what we discovered was that, you know, while 
GDP and stock markets might recover quickly, the economic and social impact of these crises goes on for a long time, and that's going to be the focus of our discussion today. I might also add that Jayati and I also went once to teach economics to the generals in Burma, and with us was Joe Stiglitz and uh, Ron Finlay and the venerable La Mint, uh, the Burmese economist who pushed for export-led growth in the 1930s and 40s when the whole world was turning, the developing world was turning towards import substitution. And Jayati, you might remember, she in this surreal capital of Nipi Dao, uh, Jayati also wrote a very nice blog on, on the capital and its white elephants, uh, literally white elephants. Uh, and those, and just to add one uh, tidbit on uh, Ravi, which is not in his CV today, is that, you know, I've always wondered how Ravi was, of course, a great theoretician, but also such a practical economist. And one key to that secret is that Ravi was also the World Bank's representative in Ghana for three years. He doesn't mention that in his short bio. But I think Ghana learned a lot from Ravi, and maybe Ravi learned a lot from Ghana at that time also. Anyway, let me not go on about my past with, with, with these two distinguished discussions and go on to the main speaker, Rohini Pandey. Uh, you have her CV. She's the Heinz uh, professor at Yale. She's the director of the Yale Growth Center. She was the co-editor of the American Economic Review Insights. She was also, she's also the editor of the Review of Economics and Statistics. And I also, she's got the Carol Bell Shaw Award for pushing for gender equality in the economics uh, profession. Um, she also, she's also got a lot of very practical experience. Uh, I remember she runs a, she runs many courses in India to teach um, policy, policy making and policy design to the bureaucracy in India. I once spoke on, uh, at her request to the academy where all the top IS officers are, are, are sent for their probationary training. Most importantly, she is from my college. Um, she is 20 years probably younger than I am, maybe even more. At the time when I went to St. Stephen's College, it was a boys only college. And then they took the enlightened decision to admit women. And today you'll get a treat, you'll get a sense of what the college would have missed uh, had it not taken that decision. Uh, and uh, so I'm very happy to introduce uh, Rohini Pandey. And thank you, Rohini, for coming to speak. And over to you now. Great. Thank you. Thanks, um, James and Ajay, for the invitation. It's great to be here. And thanks for the discussions for joining. Um, and yeah, Ajay, I think this college was a little bit more enlightened when I joined, but not fully enlightened, because at that time, they still didn't allow women as hostel residents. And um, that, I think, has changed as well since then, which is all for the better. So what I was hoping today was really to just kick off a discussion among all of us rather than take a lot of time. So let me just give some, I think, some state setting remarks and then open up for discussion. So as we know, um, you know, COVID-19 has led to a very significant decline in economic activity across the world, including India. And one of the implications of that has been is that we are likely to see for the first time in the 21st century a rise in uh, global poverty estimates. So I think after a long period of discussions of how we end extreme poverty by 2030, I think we're now having a very different discussion, which is how do we adapt policy for the case that we are seeing um, new groups of poor individuals, especially groups like the urban poor, who had been seen as a largely diminishing group. India is an important part of this discussion. Um, as the latest IMF estimates suggest, per capita growth rates this year will probably decline by something like 11%. But importantly, um, and perhaps unfortunately, India is going to take back on the mantle 
of having the largest number of extreme poor in the world out of an estimated increase of 120 million new poor, uh, 85 million are projected to come from India. So how should policy respond at such a time? I think in the, in the short run, a very common response we've seen across countries is um, cash transfers. So Hugo Gentilini from the World Bank, who has been keeping count of this, estimated that by July, across 195 countries, we saw a thousand, over a thousand um, cash transfer measures in place. And in fact, even in India, in the short run, uh, we saw a three month expansion of gender targeted cash transfers occurring at the time of the lockdown. And I'd say one of the bigger policy discussions that we're hearing quite a lot about from many commentators and researchers thinking about India is how should this uh, possibly be expanded? So there are a number of people who are pushing for universal basic income. And you know, on the other hand, there's also some discussion going on whether you should have an urban employment guarantee. And underlying this, you know, very often is this discussion that you know India is potentially well placed to do so because it has um, implemented a digital identification system. There are possibly ways we can reach uh, individuals. So what I want to do today is to share a little bit of data to make an argument that I think theory is well ahead of implementation right now. If you look at the data, what we see even for the three months of um, gender targeted transfers, we see very large errors of exclusion um, going on. And I think before we get to running too far ahead with discussions of say UBI or even urban guarantee schemes, I think it's important for us to think both what is going to be the method of implementation and importantly, who do we want to target? And here, one thing I want to point out is uh, if you want to reach groups that are possibly more vulnerable at such points at time, such as, say, lower castes or women, we're going to have to recognize that just putting in place um, Aadhaar or unique ID isn't going to be enough. So let me just very briefly share some um, data to try to make this uh, point. So I'm going to focus on really just one aspect of it, and this is not to say there are not others, but let me start by just reminding us of sort of who, at least one group who's likely going to be hard hit by the crisis, which is women. So first, let me remind you from the World Value Surveys data, a common question that we use to look at uh, norms is this question of when jobs are scarce, should men have more of a right to job than women? And so this is the data from the Indian sample. And as you can see, 61% uh, of the men and roughly half the women agree with the statement that when jobs are scarce, men should have more uh, rights to a job. And as I mentioned, you know, I think this is a relevant uh, starting point because we are at a point in time when it's very likely we're going to see a lot of jobs um, disappearing. And Perhaps one of the few data sets we have that gives us one measure of this is the CMIE household survey. And in that data, um, as has been reported, conditional on being employed pre-lockdown, the percentage point difference between, um, or the gender gap in employment post-lockdown is 23 uh, percentage points. So we, we are already beginning to see um, a relatively larger exit of at least one group of women. As I said, I'm going to focus on women, but you could imagine looking at other groups like this. Now, as I said, you know, uh, the immediate short-run response um, was to say, let's have cash transfers during lockdown, and in particular, use that to target um, uh, target PMJDY accounts. Now, the first thing here um, that one can do is you can look at um, the FI data. So this is the data from 2018 from the Financial Inclusion uh, uh, Insights Survey. And what you can, you can combine that with is just the government PMJDY uh, uh, data. And what you see is that rough, if, if we take women who are below the, um, the, the the FI poverty index, which is higher than um, the $1.9 a day, it's roughly $2.5 a day. What you find that um, roughly 176 million uh, poor women lacked a PMJDY account. 
And so by targeting it specifically to a single account, um, which was seen as the one that was perhaps the best linked up to the digital infrastructure of the government, you were roughly excluding half of the poor women in the, in the economy. Now, the reason for this exclusion was twofold. Um, a first reason was that if you just look across states, states that had moved earlier on financial inclusion, so states like, for instance, uh, some of the southern states like Kerala, their PMJDY account uh, take up was lower because these were already banked households and already banked women. So there were a number of women even below the poverty line in relatively richer states who already had accounts, but they were just not PMJDY accounts. And then, of course, there's a second fact that if you ask about who are the women who have no account, including PMJDY, they do tend to be the poorest uh, women and also those most subject to uh, restrictive norms, for instance, on mobility and going to a, to a bank to open those accounts. And so overall, what we, what we see is that thinking about implementing something like cash transfers or UBI needs to happen very much in the context of a discussion of how are you actually going to get it to households and importantly, who in the household do you care about getting it to? Let me turn now to, I think, a, a second policy which uh, is also being discussed, and I'd argue is certainly in rural areas in the short run is much more successful, is um, Enriga. So this data uh, on the right-hand side, the blue line shows you the average number of households in a state, Madhya Pradesh, that's the state I'm going to be talking about, who worked in Enriga between 2015 to 2019. And then the red line shows you literally for a couple of months, but this can continue on just a huge spike in employment that you see under this program post COVID. Um, so, you know, the lockdown started in March. In March, we didn't see much activity. It was also the end of the financial year. But starting in the new financial year in April, we just see a huge spike in uh, work in the sector. Another thing that I think is worth noting, which I'm just going to make that point again here, is um, as I mentioned, if you look across states and you rank them by the benefits among women, um, you know, certainly poorer states, for instance, like uh, Bihar, do badly on PMJDY accounts. But actually, UP does, re Uttar Pradesh does reasonably well. And that really just reflects the fact that they didn't have other types of accounts going on. Kerala, for instance, does quite badly on PMJDY accounts because in, women were typically banked on other, in other ways. And so this just shows you that uh, a very centralized mechanism, which I think is also what the thought is right now when people think of UBI, that targets a particular type of account may miss out just the sheer variation in how states have built up their social protection system. So what I want to finally do is I want to just spend a couple of minutes talking about um, one way in which we worked in Madhya Pradesh on sort of gender targeted um, financial inclusion reforms and talk a little bit about the impact we see that had post COVID. So we worked in um, northern Madhya Pradesh in some of the more, uh, I'd say, some of the districts with the worst sex ratios in Madhya Pradesh. And um, we, what we were interested in doing was, was something that actually now is, in theory, should be commonplace, which is um, opening bank accounts for women, but then also ensuring di direct deposits of their payments into the bank account. And the reason I said that should be common now is that now with Aadhaar seeding, uh, it is the case that you should be getting payments into your own bank account. So um, we wanted to compare this case where there was financial inclusion, so women got bank accounts, with a case where you were also provided training. And as I'll talk about it, this is the kind of thing that doesn't happen enough, but is very important. And then the last was to sign them up for the Enriga direct deposit. So now your payments, which in the status quo would go into your joint household account, which typically uh, was controlled by um, the husband, now went into women's own account. This had saw high take up. So we saw that most women uh, were wanted to be enrolled in direct deposit. 
But importantly, they were also very interested in this training program, which was very explicitly just about, we'll give you 50 rupees, deposit it into a bank account, see whether you can get that to work. And the main effect that we saw both in the short run in one month later and three months later was um, when you gave direct deposit combined with training, there was an increase in their, uh, their work. And importantly, this was also associated with we found that um, women changed their beliefs about um, kind of the norms around working and their husbands changed their perceptions about the extent of stigma they would face in the community if their wives worked. But this is really more I wanted to st uh, state, uh, set stage for going back to this setting. And just to remind you, um, over the last, uh, just after the lockdown, we saw a very significant rise in work in these areas. And we wanted to see whether um, the intervention still mattered. And so what this shows you is uh, starting uh, during this year, um, the light blue line is the women for whom, and this is a randomized trial, so these, these are um, uh, at the start of the intervention, similar households, uh, where women were just given accounts. So they could certainly work still, they were eligible for Enriga, uh, but they were not given direct deposit. And then the dark blue line is women who received both a direct deposit uh, facility and training. And so what we see here is post the pandemic, there is a very significant difference arising in their ability to access and receive payments. And I put this out here just to make the point that I think as we think about response to COVID, it's not going to be as simple as saying, let's put in place cash transfers. Certainly a lot of what needs to be done is money needs to be released, money needs to be released to states. But I think the main takeaways that I'd love to start discussion on is um, this is not going to be something that we're going to transform in a day. So we have to, in deciding what policies are put in place, think very significantly about how we're going to um, you know, who we want to reach and what we need to do in order to reach those individuals. Um, I think just pushing for something like a UBI or a do it employment uh, guarantee program in urban areas uh, is will reach some individuals, but the extent of targeting might be relatively low unless we have uh, other uh, programs alongside. So let me stop here and open up for discussion, and then I'm happy to come back to discuss other aspects also of uh, implementation of programs post-COVID. Great, thank you so much, Rohini. Uh, let's turn it over first to uh, uh, Ravi Kanbar. Ravi? Thanks, uh, thanks, James, thanks, Ajay, and uh, thanks, Rohini. Uh, so in, in discussions with uh, Ajay, uh, I suggested that what I would do is actually just to step back and take a broader perspective on, on these issues, uh, not focused on India uh, as much because Rohini and Jayati and so on have a uh, lot, lot more experience in the Indian case uh, than I do. Um, so let me just, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ajay mentioned the, the financial crisis and uh, during the financial crisis, I actually made a presentation to the World Bank board uh, with the title "Preparing for the Next Crisis," uh, that while in the while we're in the middle of this crisis, let's think about crises more generally. Uh, and I think some of the themes that I pick up will will relate to some of Rohini's comments uh, uh, as well. So the point is that uh, that this crisis will be followed by others. Uh, and uh, what are the sort of? Uh, and I'm I'm, I'm going to focus on systemic crises. And what are the features of these sorts of crises or these sorts of shocks? Uh, of course, they have a major negative impact, and average incomes will fall drastically. Otherwise, it would merit, merit the label crisis. So poverty will surely increase at the same time as resources available to address these needs will decline, and that's something that we've seen in the data. But in some sense, this is where the commonality of crises ends. Crises can have multiple origins, climate, weather, financial, unrest in neighboring countries, global collapse of a particular industry, infectious diseases, of course, and so on. Uh, and the point is that each of these different types of crises can have very different impacts on the economy, depending on the detailed structure of the economy and the nature and the exact nature of the crisis. So although it's definitionally true that a, that a systemic crisis will reduce the mean of the income distribution, the impact on the composition of this distribution is actually difficult to predict ex ante, 
And who exactly is made poorer and in what way is not revealed until the crisis is well upon us. And the second point is that the timing of the crisis of these crises is not known ex ante. We can probably say that one of these types of crises will kick in sometime in the next few years. But when exactly it will happen is not known. Uh, crises can come suddenly, and when they do come, we'll not know uh, quite how quickly they will they will recede. And it's these two features of systemic crises, the uncertainty about who exactly uh, the crisis yet to come will impoverish, and uncertainty about when the crisis yet to come will strike and when it will recede. I think these are the these are key in conceptualizing a social protection response to systemic crises. The first feature, the uncertainty about who exactly the crisis to come will impoverish, I think requires us to think of social protection as a system rather than assessing it component by component, program by program, uh, as, we, as we tend to do. And of course, that's quite right from a programmatic point of view. This is, of course, needed. Uh, and when the crisis is upon us, we have to act to, to protect the most vulnerable in whatever way we can. But actually, by the time the schemes are up and running, the crisis will most likely have passed. And this certainly happened at the, at the time of the financial crisis. And the next crisis will probably be of a very different nature with a very different impact, as we now see. So I think we have to have a more general system of social protection capable of ex ante handling poverty increase coming from a wide range of different sources. But again, this is following a little bit on, on Rohini's point that I'm not suggesting there has to be a single or uniform mechanism for social protection. And there are good reasons why different types of mechanisms are, are appropriate in rural and in urban areas, for example. Rather, what I'm saying is that we have to look at the collection of mechanisms as a system and ask whether as a collectivity they provide protection to the poor against a range of crises. And even if a uniform, a universal uniform scheme is appropriate in ideal circumstances, actually we have the system we have as a practical matter and reform has to start from that basis. The second feature of, this, of the cri of crisis that we do not know when they will strike and when they will recede, I think requires that the social protection system as a whole be flexible, that it be capable of being scaled up rapidly when a crisis strikes, and that it be capable of being scaled down when the crisis passes. I think this is another set of questions we have to ask about the different schemes that are being tried out now. I think this flexibility has both technical and political economy dimensions. Uh, take two examples, the standard food and fuel subsidies can be scaled up very easily. Uh, you know, for example, for oil importers, all it requires is simply suspending price pass through provisions. And it's this ease of scaling which, which perhaps leads civil society and the polity generally to gravitate towards this type of instrument. The alarm bells are usually run by technocrats who point to the difficulty of scaling down these subsidies because of political economy resistance when the crisis passes. Public works programs, on the other hand, offer employment at a relatively low wage. When a crisis strikes, applications of the work sites increase. We saw this in, the, in Rohini's graph. When the crisis fades and people have better employment opportunities elsewhere, applications will fall off. Why should they stay here at a low wage? The scaling down in some sense is automatic. So the problem I don't think is so much scaling down. I think the problem really is on the scaling upside. And, the, and here again, the questions are uh, technical and political economy questions. On the technical side, as the applications increase, the question is whether there will be useful projects to be worked on, or will it just be digging holes to fill them up again? And this depends crucially on whether there exists a high return shelf of projects which have been prepared and ready to go. And this depends on adequate, pro adequate project preparation in normal times, and I'm going to come to this point in a minute. On the political economy side, and perhaps Rohini can comment on this given her graph, uh, the question is simply whether the budget will increase as applications increase. If not, then either the wage will have to fall or there will have to be rationing, and rationing, as we know, tends to dis discriminate against disadvantaged groups. One way of easing this politi political economy tension on funding is to provide funds from the scaling up from the outside, either in terms of a state uh, from the center or in terms of the country from the outside, from the international community. And that's what I now want to turn to, which are what are the implications of this way of thinking for the international community? If we accept this above line of argument, uh, uh, what does it mean for the international community generally? And for example, for an agency like the World Bank, uh, which both Ajay and I used to work for. In my writings, I've proposed three lines of action. And elements of these are, of course, already present. I'm not saying these are new. I'm just suggesting a more systematic and sustained effort in these directions. First, the international community should support assessment of social protection, assessment of social protection programs in a country as a system of protection for the poor against systemic crises. 
This takes us beyond the many excellent evaluations of individual programs that exist and are ongoing. And actually what I have in mind is stress testing of the system, stress testing of the system as a whole against a range of potential crises so as to identify one, the gaps in coverage, and two, enhancements in flexibility for scaling up and scaling down. And actually, I view this as being somewhat analogous to what the Financial Sector Assessment Program, the FSAP, does for the financial sector. What does the FSAP do? What does it, it, it imagines different types of crises. It, it applies them, uh, uh, it simulates them into the existing system and says, where are the weaknesses? If this industry collapses, which bank will be hurt, and then what will be the knock-on effects, et cetera? And I would say that we should do a similar type of exercise on what might be termed the SPAP, the Social Protection Assessment Program, a systemic evaluation of the impact of imagined crises, imagined but, uh, uh, but obviously salient crises in the years to come. Second, and this is perhaps a more standard recommendation, is that based on recommendations of this assessment, the international community should, over the medium term, finance improvements in coverage and in flexibility. And of course, this, is, this perhaps comes, as I said, closest to what is normally done uh, in the international community and the World Bank and so on. But actually, elements of this may not be that easy. Take, for example, uh, the issue of having a shelf of projects ready to go when the crisis strikes. Imagine going to the World Bank board and asking for funds to prepare a shelf of projects, but at the same time saying that these projects may not actually be implemented anytime soon. Indeed, actually, we hope that they're never going to be implemented because we hope the crisis will not come. Uh, and, uh, and the reaction of funders to that I think is an, is an interesting thing to think about. And it's clear to me that a major change in mindset will be needed by many in the international community or at the center vis-a-vis -vis Indian states to finance project preparation without there being the immediate, so to speak, or not too far away immediate step of the concrete being poured. My third and final point is that the international community should consider developing pre-qualified lines of assistance for social protection, which kick in automatically when certain crisis triggers are breached and for which access to this does not have to go through the usual time-consuming institutional processes, through a rejigging of institutional arrangements, which are not designed for crisis reallocation funds, and doing it all in a race against time because a crisis is upon us. The Social Protection Assessment Program, which I talked about earlier, would provide the evaluation on the basis of which countries will pre-qualify for various amounts of funds through this window, the amount depending on the assessment, and access will be governed by triggers, predetermined pre triggers that identify the crises of certain magnitude and the crisis, of course, not being of the country's own making. So my question is, why should there not be a social protection flexible credit line analogously to the flexible credit lines that we're aware of? Now, IBRD's deferred drawdown option, the DDO, comes closest to what I have in mind. But one, this is only for middle income countries. And two, the funds do not constitute a window for additional resources. It's simply a rejigging of the total available resource. So let me conclude by saying that, uh, that there are indeed many initiatives that attempt to address the role of social protection in the face of crises. The purpose of my three proposals, which are built on this conceptual, uh, conceptual way of thinking that I, that I started with, the purpose of these proposals is to challenge us to think systematically and to think big about, so, about the social protection system as a whole in the face of systemic, in the face of systemic crisis. Somewhat paradoxically, unanticipated crises are likely to be the norm in development as we go forward, so we had better be ready to protect the poor when they strike. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ravi, for those comments. Um, I want to turn it over now to uh, Jyoti Ghosh. Proceed, Jay. Thank you so much, James. And thank you, uh, Ajay, for inviting me to this really fascinating and insightful, thoughtful discussion. So I actually hugely agree with what has already been said. And I'm going to just take up some of the aspects of this. In fact, Ravi, uh, I don't know if you participated in these discussions of the Global Social Protection Fund that happened a, a few weeks ago, but you would have made a very, I think, important contribution to that discussion and uh, based on what you've just said. I, I want to pick up on some of the points that Rohini made, which I think are, are very important. One is uh, this whole issue of relying on the UID, the unique identity and Aadhaar as a means of determining the beneficiaries of any of these schemes. And I completely take her point that there are huge concerns about exclusion, that uh, taking any one single indicator as the indicator for determining who is going to be the beneficiary, as was the case, for example, in the rather limited cash transfers that were provided through the Jantanakans, 
uh, is also necessarily exclusionary. And of course, therefore, there's a case for looking at a wider set of recipients. So you could take, for example, in addition to those who hold these PM uh, Janthan bank accounts, you could take the those who had registered for the rural employment guarantee because that's and who have asked for work under that you could have to, in the period especially when we were not providing work you could take the recipients of pensions and you could take recipients of the annapurna food scheme which is the extremely destitute as a basic base for cash transfers now i'm not a big votary of cash transfers in general but i think a situation of a pandemic makes these necessary and in, in fact deeply desirable because that's not just a question of welfare it's actually compensation for the loss of livelihood that has been created by lockdown and pandemic and so on having said that uh, i think one major aspect of social protection in countries like india is that of food access and uh, one of the extraordinary features of the indian policy response has been the lack of sufficient expansion of food distribution at a time when, in fact, there was nothing preventing it, when the uh, food stocks held by the Food Corporation of India have actually almost doubled in size. They were already three times in excess of the buffer stock norm at the start of the pandemic, and they went up to more than 120 million tons when the buffer stock norm is uh, about 24 million tons. And uh, since then, they have remained pretty much above 100 million tons, which is extraordinary in a country where there is a very severe increase in hunger, which is well known, and which also has, uh, again, as is well known, a stronger gender dimension, that typically women and girls tend to be less provided when there is inadequate supply of food within a household. So I think the aspect of food distribution is uh, very, very important. Now, the... Um, Ravi talked about how you need to have schemes that are capable of scaling and flexible. And here I really, I mean, I think, Rohini, you made this point that, okay, uh, you know, uh, cash transfer or an urban employment guarantee, they tend to exclude. But there are huge advantages to an employment guarantee. One is that it's self-targeting, definitionally, that it provides precisely that possibility of scaling in both directions because of the fact that it, if it is truly demand-driven, as the law in the rural case provides, and ideally, if there is a law in the urban case, it would also be, because it hasn't been implemented, but it should actually move with the demand for work, with the actual demand for work, rather than just what governments choose to register. And I think there is huge scope for expanding an, uh, a, a, a rural guarantee to uh, make it available to all adults rather than all households, to expanding the number of days because in periods of crisis, we have found many states where the households have already reached the 100 day level when it's you know half the year is left. And uh, so make it for adults, make it 150 days, and make sure that every individual worker has an individual bank account, which some state governments have already done, but of course has to be done elsewhere. Otherwise you get precisely the problem that uh, you mentioned. It's in the urban areas, there is a huge potential for also, and actually also in rural areas, for including certain kinds of skilled work at, like, at higher wages and introducing elements of training. There have been interesting proposals put up. The Azim Premji University and a bunch of others have provided um, very useful discussions of the kinds of things you could have for an urban employment guarantee. Some state governments have already begun the process. Kerala, Jharkhand has recently announced it. Rajasthan is, has just announced it and so on. Uh, of course, it remains to be seen how these will be developed. But I think that the point about these employment schemes is precisely that they have those two advantages that Ravi mentioned, uh, which make them very desirable in a situation where just the administrative costs of targeting and the possibilities of exclusion are so very great. But I think all of these schemes, uh, and this becomes a more general point, not just about India, but broadly in many developing countries that have federal systems, all of these schemes are hugely dependent on the issue of federalism and the, the role the, and the constraints facing state governments. I think this is not a pattern that is confined to India. You find it in, in Brazil, in the United States, in a bunch of other countries where 
state governments or provincial governments are effectively responsible for not just social protection, but pretty much all of the aspects that affect the material life of citizens. During pandemic, the health sector typically under their control. Uh, in the case of livelihood loss, in the case of a whole range of other infrastructure amenities and so on. And yet they don't have the same kind of financial and fiscal flexibility. In fact, they don't have any financial and fiscal flexibility most of the time. In India, we have seen this system stretched to breaking point because of a massive centralization uh, without coordination. We've had an extraordinary situation where the National Disaster Management Act was imposed. It's a very centralizing act, which is required in a in national pandemic. It was imposed to declare a national lockdown without consulting state governments, but thereafter, state governments were just left on their own to deal with the consequences and have been left on their own to deal with the pandemic as well, without getting sufficient resources to the point where they haven't even received the tax revenues that were due to them before the pandemic started. That is to say the compensation for the GSD cess that was due to them before the pandemic started. Now, this is an extreme case, but something similar is going on in many other countries where there is this issue of a conflict between a center and a state and state governments in terms of access to resources to deal with these pandemics. I would argue that in countries as large, diverse, and uh, very, very varied as, as, as India, you must leave it to state governments, not only to devise specific ways in which schemes will be implemented, but also to ensure that the resources within that state are allocated to the areas that need the most and the forms of social protection that are most required. They will be very different between Jharkhand and Kerala or Madhya Pradesh and the Northeast uh, states. They will require, therefore, some degree of autonomy and flexibility of the state governments, even to figure out how to deliver certain schemes. Odisha, for example, delivers its pensions not based on Aadhaar, but based on a very different and very localized system of public um, distribution of the pensions on a weekly basis to those uh, in front of everybody, which reduces the possibilities of uh, graft of various kinds and so on. There are many innovations that are possible but then there's another issue, which is what determines the rules for the fund transfer for particular schemes. If it's an NREGA, the law is very clear. If it's the employment guarantee, the law says you have to give, a, make available employment when there is demand. But of course, the actual implementation is the opposite. We know that, in fact, it has been a resource-driven scheme because the central uh, government provides the money in trickles, it reaches the state governments and then the pachayats much, much later. Many times wages remain unpaid and that acts as a disincentive for state governments to actually enlarge the scheme and to prevent demand for work simply by not registering that demand when it comes up. And, and so all kinds of things happen for that reason. But there would be inevitably some need for more organized rules for determining the extent of the fund transfer and it can't be just the rules that are determined overall in normal situations for by the finance commissions which determine the allocation between center and states why because particular crises you ravi's right we're going to be facing a series of crises but each crisis has a different implication so we know that in this pandemic, the states from which there was a very large proportion of migrant workers who went to the urban areas and the states in which those migrant workers reside, both of them were disproportionately affected compared to other states. And so perhaps they required different kinds or different degrees of uh, finance available to ensure the social protection that is necessary. I think these are, uh, I think the issue of federalism is, which is, actually at breaking point in India at the moment. But I think issues of federalism have to be central even in the assessment and uh, design of social protection schemes. Because when it comes down to the ground, it's left to state governments to implement. And yet not only are they typically denied the resources, but they're also denied the kind of flexibility that is required to ensure that the resources are used in the best way possible. Okay, let me stop here and we can come back to other. Rohni, thank you so much for your comments. And now I want to have a quick uh, guidance with the audience saying now is the time to consider formulating questions.
to our uh, speaker and panel. Uh, it would be wonderful at this point for you to put them into the Q&A WebEx uh, approach uh, consideration there. So I'll start off just with uh, uh, Rohini. Could you please uh, have a quick discussion of what your uh, compatriots have just got through saying? Sure. So thanks. I think that was a very uh, rich and uh, fascinating discussion and much of it I agree with. But let me pick up on one thing, building a little bit of what uh, Ravi mentioned on thinking about this sort of World Bank social protection uh, line. I think one argument that I was trying to advance is that um, it's not as if countries like India have their implementation system so much in place that it's really a question of switching on and switching off money at the point in time when there is a crisis. And I think exactly to build on what Jayati was saying about the PDS and the food system, while food grains were not released, we definitely did see that the PDS system, especially in better functioning states like Chhattisgarh, did a relatively very good job compared to, say, cash transfers in reaching poor households, and in some cases, even reaching migrants when they were uh, allow allowed access to it. So, I so, so my concern with sort of pushing on the global system on the sort of at the times of crisis, open up funding is it takes away from the, the fact that what is needed is actually to build is to build the infrastructure for uh, strengthening social protection over time. And perhaps where that needs to come from is um, strengthening um, the ability of local governments um, and local citizens to push for these structures on an ongoing basis. A second thing that I think is related to that is, it, especially in countries like India, the amount of money they're going to get from some place like the World Bank is relatively small compared to their budget allocations in these areas. You know, especially as we've seen is, you know, country, not just World Bank, but even when we think about bilateral aid, it doesn't go to where poor people live, it goes to poor countries. And so it's missing out increasingly countries like India, Bangladesh, Nigeria, which are countries with large groups of poor individuals. Um, and so I think, again, thinking about places like the World Bank setting up these um, social protection lines, I think it will be too little too late. So my pushback would be much more is that I think we have to take, we have to take seriously this idea that what we need to strengthen is the systems through which individuals and you know local governments are going to be able to demand those responses from the state on an ongoing basis partly also because you know which crisis are we going to uh, are they going to respond to i think increasingly many of the crises we're going to see are going to be climate change related related to climate breakdowns a lot of these are going to be things like for instance um, riverine floods which are going to be relatively localized so, you know, Bihar may see the Kosi River flood. Uh, the government of India may not go to the bank for that particular uh, flood. So, again, I think the issue is going to be much more for countries like India and building our Jayati was talking about federalism. How are international agencies going to respond when their line of conduct, their, their political discussions are always at the level of the national government? Can I, uh, James, can I just come back on that? Is Please do, Ravi. Yeah. No, I think I think that's very, very, uh, very good points, uh, Rohini. I think I was, uh, I, and the World Bank in India is another another sort of separate topic which we can which we can discuss and uh, uh, how small and irrelevant. Uh, I, I often say in my starting my lectures that the World Bank is becoming irrelevant. This is in the days in the good old days at the rate of seven percent per year. So, you know, as as countries grow very fast, uh, the World Bank's resources shrink relative to that. So that's that really that wasn't my that wasn't really my point. My point was. Uh, first of all, uh, agreeing with what you're saying in terms of, in some sense, a structural analysis of thinking about systems as they are and how they can be modified to a range of imagined crises, analogously to the financial sector etc. program. That was the first one. Secondly, uh, and whether it's money flowing from the outside to a small country, or money flowing from the centre to a state, and that was, I think, Jayati's point. It's the the the, uh, the, the conceptual point is is, is the same. And I think I, I, I was emphasizing that that part of it. That we uh, that as the uh, when the crisis hits and those uh, were, those uh, muster rolls start climbing, will the funding be available for a state level or in fact even a sub-state level to finance that? 
because if, if, if the funding is not available, we know what's going to happen. We know that there's going to be rationing of different types and, and we know how that, how that works. So, so I, I, don't think we're, I don't think we're disagreeing uh, at all on this, actually. Thanks. Great. Thank you. More comments or are we from the panel? Okay, great. I see in the audience a great group of people, including Gary Fields, Louise Fox, Sudhir Shetty, John Drez, Prakash Mangani, Ina Agarwal, Frank Wong, and many others. I am hoping for some questions to appear in the Q&A shortly, but until they do, let me pose the first one, which is, there's been a lot of talk recently in the US about automatic stabilizers as an approach to solve some of the same problems you've been discussing. These are rules by which money is released into the system during recession times. And I call to your attention the book, Recession Ready, Fiscal Policies to Stabilize the American Economy, edited by my co-director, Jay Shambo. So I wanted to get your opinion on whether such an approach might be applicable in the context we're describing currently. And we could start with whoever speaks first. Well, uh, so James, let me, uh, uh, in some sense, actually, we do have an automatic response system. We have, uh, uh, in it, we have all these schemes. We have these multitude of schemes already present, and they have their own rules, they have their own operational things, and so on and so forth. And uh, and uh, we we know what happened in the in the employment guarantee uh, area. Okay? So the point is not whether these schemes uh, exist, which respond in some sense to what's going on. Is whether they're responding in the right sense <laughs> to what's going on, right, whether, whether they're whether, intentional, whether, whether, whether they're intent, but also whether uh, different schemes are actually moving together rather than moving uh, against each other, and so on. So there's that coordination type issue as well. That was my observation. Others? Okay, could I come in on that? Yeah, I, you know, Ravi, I would say the only really uh, sort of this, the only scheme that has a real automatic stabilizer built in is the NRG. It's the employment guarantee. Everything else is just the standard thing. And in fact, everything else has sh been shown to be very clunky and you know inadequate. So that even the food distribution system, which exists and is available for upscaling whenever required, it's far too dependent on administrative decisions on the top, which then have to filter down to the state government and so on. So there is a there should be ways in which the food distribution, for example, could be integrated into a much more responsive system. At the moment, the only thing we have is the rural employment guarantee. I, I would argue that that fills many of the criteria that you mentioned. And that's why I think an urban uh, guarantee is also extremely desirable, necessary, I would say even essential at this point, but with much more varied attitudes to the kinds of work that are accepted. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I would add on the food distribution system that I agree, um, you know, its, it's function has varied across states and uh, resources to get released. But the one thing that we do see is that it does manage to play some role in price stabilization. So just looking at the data and, you know, states have some ability to vary the goods they sell through the PDF shops, you know, beyond uh, um, the basic uh, list. And so, for instance, in work we did in Chhattisgarh, what we saw was that in areas that um, that put online, put chana or chickpeas into the PDS system, you saw that the price of it in private shops in, was relatively low and did not increase by that much. I mean, the one good, I guess the one good thing has been is that we haven't seen a lot of food price spikes um, during or after COVID, either in India or more generally. But to the extent that we think that, you know, in general kind of price changes um, matter a lot, I think thinking even of ways of having things like onions and tomatoes and other things being available in some way through you know localized equivalents of PDS, I think can play an important uh, stabilizing role on the price side. Yeah, completely agree. Absolutely. And in fact, the states that are doing this are already showing much better response and, and better gender distribution as well, of better nutritional outcomes overall. Yeah. So jumping into a World Bankish kind of question from Tim uh, Thomas Timberg, uh, even if the World Bank is not a large fund source, uh, is its potential one as an intellectual or convener for the assessment program for the uh, assessment process? So is that what its role should become? Maybe Ravi would be natural to respond to that. Uh, I wish I hadn't said the word the words World Bank because I don't want to get, we don't want to get pulled into just that sort of uh, discussion, which again, as Vinny says, 
uh, as an institution, certainly as a financial institution, it's 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 becoming very I mean largely irrelevant in many many uh, big big countries. Um, but I, but I, I guess the point is that it, actually it shouldn't for India it shouldn't be the World Bank it should be the center which uh, it should be the government which says we have this issue we have these crises which are uh, the uh, crises which are coming in the future which will be distributed differently across the state it will be whatever and some states will face a sudden increase in demand for funds uh, and so on. how do we address that how do we address that so that they, so that the states don't then end up rationing for example and as I said on the employment guarantee scheme employment guarantee uh, uh, guarantees starting rationing employment to meet their budgetary constraint uh, we have a very well nicely designed system we have a self-targeted system but if, no, but if there's no funding it'll soon turn into a, a rationing a rationing system so I think it's the Indian government which should convene this process not not the World Bank carrying on with the Indian government uh, uh, Malini Chakravarti says, uh, it would be great if any of you could throw light on the impact of the Indian government's response to COVID on the lower castes, including the intersection between gender and caste. So I throw that open to panel. So I think one place where I think we do see some of that is um, what's happening with um, migration. So, um, you know, so we've been following um, return migrants in a few North Indian states, and suddenly if you look at uh, female migrants who are returning, those who were working, they're very often from, say, lower caste or tribal groups. And I think, I think one big question is whether they're actually going to uh, return um, to urban areas. I think the initial data we are seeing is they're, they're much less likely to return than, say, their male uh, counterparts. And I think, in general, as we know, uh, female labor force participation is low. One of the reasons why it's low is that women are not migrating to where the jobs are. Um, so that they're getting educated in rural areas, but they're not moving out. So I think, I think to me, that that's one of the concerns is that for many lower caste women, um, you know, migrating as domestic work or through kind of skill training programs to urban areas has begun to be some way to move out and that may just become less available to them. Uh, could I also add to that? Please. Yeah, so, you know, I really think that the Indian government's policy responses, I mean, it's like an X-ray has been shown on the existing inequalities and discrimination, and you really get these highlighted. The, the responses have been so casteist and so patriarchal. I'm sorry to just put it that way, but that's really how they have been. Uh, and it operates at all levels in all kinds of ways. It's not just take the question of migrants. Migrants abroad were a given special plane flights, you know, these are these Air India flights that were designed to help them come home safely and, and et cetera, et cetera. Migrants within the country were basically treated worse than animals. They were denied livelihood with four hours notice. They were not provided social protection um, for the most part, as has been discussed already. Most of the studies find around 80 to 90 percent didn't get anything at all. And then they were not allowed to move. And when in desperation they were made to, uh, they, they were forced to walk, they were treated badly, they were sprayed with disinfectant, they were abused on the roads, they were detained in sectors. Consider the curfew rule. Curfew between, at, at one time it was eight o'clock in the morning, at night to, or seven, seven to seven, okay? What does that mean? It means migrants in the middle of the hottest summer months were forced to walk only during the daytime. They could not walk when it was cooler. And they were only had to walk because there was no other form of transport. So something like a curfew rule was not just uh, migration blind, but in a sense almost aggressively given the lower caste, dominantly lower caste migrants, a very hard time. Uh, the attitude to sanitation workers who are really frontline workers in a pandemic and who are dominantly, as we know, lower caste. The complete lack of protection for them during a very, very dangerous time. The uh, social discrimination they faced to the extent of also being thrown out of localities and being forbidden entry and so on, because they might be harboring the disease. Uh, so it, it's, it extended, I would say the casteist response extended from the very top all the way down to very local levels. The patriarchal response, I mean, we all know how lockdowns have tended to increase domestic violence, but across state governments, shelters for women victims of domestic violence were closed during the pandemic. So, I mean, I think 
the response the policy responses have actually been even more extreme than the, the social functioning that has just you know created a particular pandemic outcome. All right, then let's move on to get Gary Fields. In India, which would you prioritize for a given budget? A UBI or an urban employment guarantee from Gary Fields? Who wants to go? I mean, I, I could say, but you know, I, I, I guess I'm not very sure I love the idea of a question for a given budget. Uh, I'm not very sure that's the right way to pose the question for a social protection scheme. Uh, you know, partly because I think some of the problems with UBI really are the fact that it's not going to be something we're going to be able to provide at scale. So if you're talking about a UBI at a given budget, it's by definition is going to be a targeted UBI. It's not going to be a universal basic income because if it's a UBI, then and it's universal, it's hitting everyone. Then I don't understand the value of budget. So so. In general, my own sense is that a UBI is just not feasible given the kind of fiscal space India is in or what the money is willing to put in. And so in some ways, the only thing that really is feasible is expanding employment guarantee to urban areas, um, which has some self-targeting features and is going to be valuable to get to it. So I, I don't know, purely from a perspective of what is practical and feasible, I would say I just don't see a UBI being very feasible at scale. And if it's feasible on some very shorter level, then as Ravi said, that's going to have all kinds of issues of rationing. If it's going to have all those kinds of issues of rationing, at least an employment guarantee scheme has better features of self-targeting than I think a UBI does. Yeah, I also want to second what Rohini just said about, you know, please don't say within the given budget and so on. But having said that, she's absolutely right that, you know, uh, first of all, that the way UBI, especially in countries like India, has been interpreted is to replace existing social services and other forms of transfer with, with this. And then it's too limited. And then the amounts that you can provide are too pitiful to make much difference. But also, quite apart from an urban employment guarantee scheme being more self-targeting, it can actually provide goods and services. You can actually design schemes that enhance quality of life. Uh, just as in the rural areas designed properly, you could actually, you know, do things that improve soil quality, provide more natural pest management, you know, better water management systems, as well as other things. Similarly, you could design schemes that improve urban infrastructure, help to green the, the local economy and help to actually provide services that are often essential. So I think, you know, it's the case is overwhelming for an urban employment guarantee. So let, let me let me actually take Gary's question at face value. <laughs> and and uh, I agree, actually, I agree with what Rohini and uh, Jayati said, but 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 uh, in a way, suppose suppose there's a fixed budget. I think the question may not be appropriately posed because the typical choice is between a universal thing and a and a contingent targeted scheme and an indicator targeting scheme. Okay, and then we have all the sort of trade-offs of information costs and this and that, et cetera. Okay, that's how it's known. But the employment guarantee is a different type of scheme. It's not a continuous, it, it is as, as Jayati emphasized and Rohini emphasized, it's a self-targeting scheme. Okay. So it's it uh, so that comparison that we typically make between a universal versus an indicator targeting scheme is not appropriate in this uh, in, uh, with, a, with an urban with an employment guarantee scheme. But let me just emphasize again there are two two issues about, about employment guarantee schemes. One that uh, Jerry just mentioned, which is having this shelf of projects ready to go. So in principle, it can do it, but you know we then need a lot of preparation beforehand to have had that those projects ready and not just simply dig holes then to fill. I mean that is great in terms of the targeting point of view, but uh, in terms of building assets. And the second point is again this business of whether the funds are there to meet the uh, the demand. Uh, if if then if the funds are not there, uh, then we're back into uh, uh rationing and, and 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 that sort of stuff and how do the funds get there well there's of course a political economy issue but then again the center state relations turn out to be important so i think we're back again to that to that discussion so that will be my response thanks thank you so much Rev. Uh, now from jean drez according to a recent micro save study one third of women with pmjdy accounts are unable to confirm that they received any relief money what to make of this? 
So, I mean, I, I, I think I don't know the study, so I don't know what the sample is. I've looked at some data based from one of the largest banks in India, so just looked at withdrawals. And I have to say, I was actually surprised that dormancy um, rates, which, would, which would capture you know, people getting cash transfers into their account, but not taking that out, was lower than I expected. It was something like 5% of the accounts were dormant. Because I think that, to me, going in was one of the main things I thought would, among those who have PMJDY accounts, restrict its use, is that there's a belief that there's a very significant fraction of them that are dormant, that they exist, but people don't use much. So I was actually surprised to find those dormancy rates, and this was kind of reasonably poor women in Madhya Pradesh who had uh, who um, who said that they, who who in just in the bank administrative data we didn't see them removing. So it could be that Microsave has a larger sample of women with dormant accounts, uh, but I think the actual just act of transferring those those uh, funds, at least for larger banks, into bank accounts seem to have been reasonably smooth from what at least I saw in the administrative data. Um, just to add to that, I mean, Jean knows better than all of us uh, the limitations, I think, of the PMJDY uh, system. Uh, there are studies that have been found that about 30% of the holders are not actually poor at least in the Indian definition of poor, below the poverty line, uh, because of the way the scheme was rolled out and the attempt to get as many people as possible. There are people who have multiple accounts and then one of them is a PMJDY account. And there are other households that have been just registered because you needed to get as many people and banks had to fill so many numbers and so on. I think the dormancy rate has come down in the aggregate. It used to be about 24%. I think it's now about 18%, which is reasonably high rate still. but. I don't think that's the point. I think it's the point is more uh, the one that Rohini made at the very beginning that it just excludes so many poor people and poor women in particular. That you know, that it's it's bad. Okay, thirty percent of those who really shouldn't be in it are supposedly in it, but that's not the big problem. The big problem is that it doesn't capture the majority of poor women. And uh, if you really wanted to give cash transfers in that period of the pandemic, when other livelihood or even employment schemes were not available, you really had to have a much broader coverage, relying on those who are registered with REGA, registered with Annapurna, registered for pensions and so on. You could have done it in a more imaginative way rather than just sticking to the Janthan accounts. Okay, so let's turn it over then to Nebraska Grayson, who asked the question, have pre-existing assessments in India been able to capture who has become the new poor due to COVID-19? How do we need to improve our assessments to better enrich our knowledge of which groups are being impacted uniquely by crises like pandemics? Panel? So maybe let me, let me just uh, uh, turn the question in, in, in the following way and say, uh, it's again mean, related to what I was saying, which is you know, uh, the point is that crises are going to be of different types, uh, and this this one is different from the financial crisis, it's different from uh, from floods, from from different types. And again, thinking very conceptually now, suppose that for for crisis of type A, where you work through who the new poor are, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, a social protection uh, arrangement of type A star is best. Let's stipulate that. And then for crisis of type B, social protection system of B star is the best. Uh, the question for us is <laughs> if there's a 50% chance of A and 50% chance of B, uh, what sort of system should we, should we have in place? What combination of A star and B star would best address that, uh, 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 the fact that we don't know what the crisis is going to be? I don't have an answer to that question, but clearly it requires for each of the two types of crises, A and B, that we have a sense, a sense of who it is who's going to be impacted by that by that crisis. Uh, a collapse in tourism because of uh, violence or whatever is one type of thing. Uh, infectious disease is another type of thing. Uh, floods is another type of thing, and so on. Uh, could I? Yeah, yeah. So you know, I don't have an answer to that question. I think yeah, Ravi has made this important general point, but. It just struck me that, you know, in all this discussion, we haven't actually talked about health protection as one of the basic elements of social protection. And I think one of the big 
aspects or dimensions of disadvantage that already disadvantaged people and poor people have had in this is the real decline in access to health facilities. Immunization rates have dropped. 40% decline in women accessing reproductive facilities in institutions. Uh, cancer patients, especially among the poor, not getting treatment. Tuberculosis people not getting medicines. And this is, we have only anecdotal or journalistic reportage to tell us because we don't really have proper surveys, but except for immunization, we have some data. But we do know that those who were already getting inadequate access to health care are now much, much worse off, even for non-pandemic related requirements. And I think that is a particular aspect of disadvantage which uh, and social protection, which really needs to be underlined because the Indian government and many state governments have also ignored that. I mean, I think just to build on uh, what Jayati was saying and maybe a little bit of a response to Ravi. So I agree that crises will have different different groups being affected. But I think, unfortunately, there are those who are already a little bit on the outlines who are going to be hit the hit harder because, you know, someone who is just making do or has just escaped poverty, a small hit is going to hit them much more than someone who is comfortably upper middle class. And so I think in that case, one way to think about who the new poor are, I think it was very much those, let's say, who had migrated to urban areas and had just begun, you know, uh, having a better life or in um, rural areas, those who had, for instance, managed to start working in the many mom and pop schools that had opened across rural areas and are now beginning to shut down. And then I think the other group that I think we should be particularly concerned at the point of this is is, um, is um, those who are in schools right now. I think you know schools have been shut for a long period of time. In some states, uh, they remain shut, and it's I think it's groups like girls who are probably less likely to go back to schools when they open. I think that's what we saw from the Ebola crisis as well. That unless you have mechanisms there, so so I agree that each crisis will bring a different group, but. I would start by looking at groups that have been historically disadvantaged. They are, they're the ones who are probably the first to fall back into poverty. Great. Well, uh, just a simple question, uh, which has to do with the answer to that question, if you take into account all the dimensions of well-being. So now let's take, I assume you were implicitly thinking a monetary approach. Do you think that the way that we would look at all of this and the policy responses would differ greatly if we, in fact, had adopted something more holistic or multidimensional as our concept and definition of poverty? Supposing we don't think about it in terms of poverty, but we think about it instead in terms of the more positive thing about what is the kind of social protection you would provide? And, you know, I mean, it's there, right? It's, that, that stuff is available to us. There is the idea of a global social protection floor, which lays out a whole range of things which every human being should have access to over the life cycle, which covers you know, some degree of basic services. It covers some degree of basic So I think we already have this idea of a social protection floor. And then the question would be using Ravi's principles, how do we ensure that that social protection floor is available, including in periods of shocks and over economic cycles? Fantastic. Can I, can I ask a question, James? Uh, yes, go ahead. So, so you know, uh, this is a very fascinating discussion and thank you. Just to inject two, uh, two ideas and picking up from what was said by uh, the panelists. Um, one is that, you know, when I went to India, for example, to start the evaluation office, what struck me was how centralized the schemes were already. Now, the 14th Finance Commission shifted more resources to the states. Of course, there's there's been this imbroglio with the GST, et cetera. But I would have thought that the 15th Finance Commission, or is it the 16, 15th one now or 16th, I forget the numbers, but the one that's still ongoing, uh, led by NK Singh, I mean, given that they are working their way through a pandemic, you would think that they would 
uh, have some ideas on how to give this kind of uh, building on this uh, point that Ravi made about you know if you do a uh, whether in India whether it's the World Bank or in India of course it's the central government how can one build a financing set of financing mechanisms which give much greater flexibility and more resources to the states. And the other thing that I, I wanted to ask was, you know, there's always this issue about the urban, um, I like the idea of the urban um, uh, scheme, uh, 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 you know, guarantee scheme. And one thing that always struck me was how low is property taxes in India and, uh, and how little flexibility there is not just for state governments, but then further down for local government, and whether a mechanism by which property taxation can be used to finance a lot of these uh, social protection systems that would be necessary for India. And also one thing, Jayati, that struck me was that in the last global financial crisis, I remember a survey done of returned migrants and who said, they would hardly be capable or able to go back to doing Manrega type work. And now we find there's a huge spike in Manrega. So some of these numbers did strike me as very different from the last financial crisis. Anyway, I throw a few thoughts out there for the panel to chew on if you like. Uh, so again, uh, uh, forgive me for using the World Bank terminology, so to speak but I think it applies in, in a similar way to what you said. So, but it's just that I've, I've written about it in, the, in those terms. The whole, uh, the whole notion of setting money aside for a rainy day, <laughs> is what this contingency fund type thing uh, is, is extremely difficult to manage uh, in the sorts of accounting systems and so on that we have in our, in our governments. Uh, you know, the, the, or, or you say, well, you know, I, I've set aside this, you know, uh, $100 million. Uh, and it's just lying there. That is very difficult for donor agencies, their accounting systems so on, to handle. So that's one point. But second, look at it from the user side as well. And again, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in terms of finance ministers, but the same thing in terms of state, uh, state and center. So there's this $100 million just lying there, and an election is coming up. And uh, the, the natural instinct for a finance minister of a country is to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to use as much of this as I, as I can. So those are the sort of difficulties that, that, that one has on both on the, on the people who are, who are controlling the purse, whether it's the center or, or international, and people who are sort of using it on this side. And that's what I sort of came across. That's, those are the difficulties that I, that I came across, uh, even on the recipient side, so to speak. Uh, because, you know, when, when the sun's shining the, and then elections coming up, the tendency is to use up that money rather than keep it as a, as a contingency fund. And then when you start putting controls on it, then you get issues from the other side, uh, so to speak. Anyway, that's my observation. Um, yeah, uh, also to come in on that, I did just uh, in response to the last point you made, I, this crisis is different from the previous crisis. It's infinitely worse. I don't think we have a real idea how bad it is, but there is no question that, uh, you know, that was a walk in the park, the global financial crisis compared to what is going on in the Indian economy in the last year. Uh, because it it's a it simultaneously hit demand and supply, but the demand shock has been much much more significant. It's been more prolonged and lingering. We haven't had a fiscal response that is even anywhere near commensurate. In fact, fiscal spending over the first six months of the year has actually been only eight percent more in nominal terms than the previous year, which is unimaginably low compared to the requirement. And so we have a combination of things which is actually uh, you know, making things way beyond anything that we experienced in 2008 and 9. Uh, that, I think, leads, to, you know, this, the issue you raised about property tax. Well, you know, the centralization that has been going on, the fiscal centralization, has actually made it almost impossible for state governments to do anything on property tax or stamp duties. Even JNNURM, which was done under the previous government, had rules about what, what stamp duties gov state governments could impose. And now there are other whole bunch of centrally, uh, central government schemes which are contingent on state governments not putting in place these kinds of uh, further taxation. In addition, GST meant state governments gave up their revenue raising rights. 
I think this system is being strained to breaking point. I believe that you will actually maybe even get a collapse of the GST system because state governments are understandably extremely angry at the fact that they have given up any kinds of revenue raising powers and are being denied even the money that has been due to them in a period when they're left holding the entire baby of the pandemic and the outcomes, uh, the economic outcomes. So I think property tax is just the tip of the iceberg of the inability of state governments to raise any kinds of resources or even have freedom to decide what they would do with those resources. I think you can't have an economy like India, which is as diverse and uh, very, very, uh, you know, at different levels of development, you can't have that economy persist with this kind of centralization. I mean, the one thing I'd add, which is a little bit to the side, is, and what we haven't talked about really is, um, you know, dealing with the economic crisis is not really going to happen until we deal with the pandemic and the health um, crisis. And I think that in itself is, in some ways, an opportunity for demand is for some amount of employment creation. I think, you know, India has historically had good systems of contact tracing. It's had, you know, that's how it, 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 it kind of ended uh, system like polio. And so there is a question of why we're not seeing a lot more investment in, say, just uh, increasing our health system rather than having doctors going on strike for not being paid, Alanwari workers are saying they don't have PPE and not being paid. So there's also this question that somehow, and you know, maybe economists have been as guilty of it as everyone else is, we fo by focusing on the economic crisis, I think it's important that we always at the same breath be saying that, you know, any response to the economic crisis has to start with, you know, getting COVID under control and then hopefully, you know, getting rid of it and in a country like India where, you know, one is willing to be quite, um, you know, not care a lot about things like privacy, you know, there is possibility to actually have very good contact tracing systems. And, you know, there's, there's, the push on that has to be much stronger rather than us thinking about too fast thinking about a comparison of this with the recession of 2008 and nine. Great, one last battery of questions and then we'll have a quick summary. Um, first from RT Reddy. Interested in how cities need to change fundamentally in order to provide better access to housing, sanitation, public services to the urban working poor, which in such a crisis become even more important. And also Nebraska Grayson who says to add to my question, if health outcomes and schooling were more incorporated into assessment and also holding government's feet to fire, uh, like through an MPI or MPI, do you think we would see more cash transfer type policies or more training infrastructure improvement type policies? Those are the remaining two questions. We'll finish up this round. Let, let, let me have a go at answering the first question. Uh, I think cities in India need to change fundamentally anyway. Okay, uh, but of course, in response to the pandemic, of course, in response to uh, the need for climate mitigation and, and all of that. But, uh, you know, I mean, we have messed up our urbanization in unimaginable ways. I'm not right now in Delhi, but my family and friends tell me that it's, uh, uh, you know, it's you cannot breathe outside. And that being outside for five hours is the equivalent of smoking 77 cigarettes a day. So uh, we have destroyed our cities in all kinds of ways, and there's going to be a lot of work required to read, uh, to change that. And it's not just our big cities. Of course, Delhi is a classic and very shining example, or not shining, whatever it is the opposite. But um, we're doing this to small towns. Aurangabad, you cannot breathe. Uh, you know, relatively small, uh, large villages are uh, have huge problems of infrastructure, waste disposal, e-waste uh, disposal, all kinds of things. And then, of course, we have created systems whereby people are forced into very, very long commutes for their daily activities, which again is unnecessary carbon emitting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we would have to do a fundamental rethink of our urbanization. That's much more difficult because we've already done so much of it in this haphazard kind of way. I mean, they just grow, right? They just grew like, like Topsy in Uncle Tom's cabin. So we now have to change that, which is much tougher than designing a whole new city in a better, more ecological, uh, more sustainable way. 
I don't think there's enough attention to this at all in our urban planning. We are not thinking about water management. We're not thinking about waste disposal. We're not thinking about e-waste, which by the way, is soon going to become an issue that is going to hit us all in the face because of the massive health hazards associated with that. Uh, we are not thinking about the broader issues of pollution, congestion, and so on. So yes, we have to redesign our cities. Uh, the kinds of things that we are, that the pandemic exposed, the inequalities of class, of caste, of gender, and so on, they are so deep in our cities, but they're all under the surface be behind this veneer. And so many of these strategies that are generally taken as the norm in urbanization studies all over the world will not work or will have very opposite effects because of these forms of inequality and discrimination that already exist in our urban areas. I think we, we really have not paid adequate attention to this. It's, it, it's many, many millions of time bombs waiting to explode. And some of them are already exploding, actually. Thank you, Joy. Um, Ravi, any final comments? No, I, I mean, in terms of that, in terms of that uh, question, uh, I mean, I would say that in, in, no, in, in terms in terms of the question of Nebraska Grayson, um, it, you know, the MDI NPR is of course evaluating outcomes, as it says, outcomes. That is, whether a, whether a, this policy or that or that policy will have a big or small effect on this outcome or that outcome is not at all addressed by uh, by the measurement of the outcomes and characterizing the outcomes. Uh, and but sometimes it seems as though people use it for that with that in mind. But Nebraska's qu and, uh, question is exactly is exactly right. I, I don't think we know. I don't think we know the answer to that question. And we and we, I don't think the MDI will give us an answer to that question. It's it's very good in answering other questions. It's excellent, but it won't give the answer to that question. I don't think. Rohini, do you want to bring it to a close, please? Um, and there are a lot really in that it's been a great discussion and I think we've talked covered on many different things, but I, I mean, just to harp on the one thing that I think I started with is, um, as Ravi said, and, you know, JK mentioned, you know, India is going to see not just more crisis, but there are a number of ways in which its uh, public system is, uh, you know, under increasing strain. And so I think, you know, when we talk about strengthening social protection, I think I would say that we should be careful to not make it sound like this very technocratic exercise that is about cash transfers. It's about identifying the fiscal space. I think a lot of it is actually asking is, what are the reforms we need to our democratic system, to our local government systems so that individuals can actually demand what they need at times of need and those messages get through fast. You know, what, do, what does it take for migrants to become, for instance, a much more visible presence in the political scene than they are so that you don't realize when you announce a lockdown that you're suddenly going to have all, all, all of these migrants on the road. So let me just stop with that. Thanks. Point to stop. I want to thank uh, Rohini Pandey Ravi Kanbar and uh, Jayati Ghosh for their thoughtful insights and to our audience for their questions and attention. And now from the George Washington University and our Envisioning India series, good day and good evening. <laughs>